from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. The character of a man can be measured by the characters he attracts. By that measure, star class world champion and colorful America's Cup skipper Tom Blackholder remains an unforgettable legend a quarter century after his death. Though wicked smart, school never matched Tom's passion for boats, cars, or girls. Tom's competitive spirit and bad boy style were personified with the name of his second star boat, Good Grief, the favorite refrain of comic strip character Charlie Brown, who was constantly in trouble and outsmarted by his female muse, Lucy. To celebrate the Yacht Racing Association's rededication of our favorite weather mark, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon hosted a Zoom call rogues gallery of Tom's buddies to recount tales of our fallen friend and hero. Well, the response was so great that we have two programs. So welcome to part one of Remembering Black Holler, a most colorful sailing legend. Okay, so welcome everybody to our fun, informal, uh, we're gonna call it rechristening of the Black Holler buoy. Uh, those of you who've been using it as a weather mark lately have found it more and more and more challenging. Just where is the weather mark? It's up there because it kept sinking and getting lower. And so uh, to be, kick things off, we want to welcome our commoner, Bill Dana. Come on up, Billy. Ron, thank you very much. And uh, thank everyone for uh, showing up today. Um, this, is a, this is a great thing for, uh, I think, one of our most accomplished members of St. Francis Yacht Club ever. Um, I didn't know Tom well. I sailed against him a couple times. I never sailed with him. I think he actually helmed Fujimo one time. Was that a, a tiller 50 footer? <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, anyway, he he won. I think he he won everything. But uh, you know, I, I wish I had a chance to actually get him to know know him better. But he was a, he was a little bit older than me, and I I think I joined the club, you know, uh, right when uh, you know uh, he was still still sailing. But um, in any case, what a great day. I'm going to have to excuse myself for a second because I'm being waved over to uh, you know give away the check for the to the uh, uh, the fire department. There's a lot of stuff going on, which is a really good thing. So anyway, again, thank you for showing up, Ron, uh, Bruce, everybody. Thanks for putting this together, and we're really looking forward to having a new buoy out there because you know trying to uh, you know find that thing in the fog, you know, even ten boat lengths away is a challenge these days. So uh, what a great accomplishment, and Scott, you some nice job on the paint job. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everybody. <laughs> So all of this really happened because, as usual, you know, the initiative of a person inside the Yacht Club got the ball rolling. That person is an incredibly accomplished sailor, but he's also a super organizer. Multiple time yeah, Sailor of the Year and Yachtsman of the Year, Bruce Stone. Bruce, come on up. And tell Uh, I'm starting to get older like the rest of us here and I really had a hard time finding black holder from some distance away closer up. And uh, why, uh, why, is the movie so hard, why is the movie so hard to find? So I uh, looked it up and found out that uh, it was indeed a YRA buoy, not a Yacht Club buoy, and I had to go to YRA to see what they thought about it. And they said, well, um, we don't have any money for fixing this stuff up. But uh, Greg Marr and the Sailing Foundation reminded me there's a buoy uh, fund that was funded a long time ago when this was launched and uh, said, so let's go talk to them. And they said, sure, take the project on. So I did some research, found the biggest possible buoy we could find that was reasonable, the Coast Guard would allow us to put in. And um, Scott Eason donated his time to uh, wrangle it and get the ground tackle and paint it and make this thing happen. So I'm really happy that uh, everybody came together to uh, make this successful event. I thought it would be a waste of time to throw it in the water and not have a reunion of all the people who are here today. Called up Ron and said, let's, let's, let's make a Wednesday yachting luncheon out of this. And uh, we are planning to do that with uh, some excerpts of the speeches you guys are going to come up and give about your experiences with Tom Blackhaller. Um, and then there will also be like a Zoom call in a few weeks where you can dial in and people who weren't able to make it will be able to participate as well. Uh, there are beverages here. We've got non-alcoholic juices and sparkling waters, and we've got uh, beer. 
So uh, help yourself to that, and I'll hand it over to Ron. Thanks, buddy. So, uh, so those of us who knew Tommy knew that he was incredibly colorful. Uh, there are those who think that, you know, the character of a club can be measured by the character of its members. And Tommy fit that bill uh, perfectly. You know, he was cut from the Rhett Butler, uh, Ted Turner, Marlon Brando kind of rebel kind of guy. And uh, he was, while that was his personality, on the other hand, he was incredibly, incredibly proud of his children, of Brooke and of Lisa. And uh, he was incredibly happy. Lisa only went to three colleges. She went to Brown, she went to Berkeley, and she finally finished up at the farm down here, Stanford. And uh, we knew that it would be perfect if Lisa would come up. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam, for reaching out to me. And uh, it's just so great to be here. And just a little history, Bruce. After he died, and we, I don't know who came up with the idea originally for the buoy, but it was a YRA buoy, so we could have saved you a lot of red tape telling you that, but, um, and it was put out there, and then the understanding, hi Russ, the understanding was that when it broke free, we would replace it, so I'm really happy, I know this, that one's lasted 30 years. So hopefully this one will last 30 years or more. <laughs> and so this is really fun. I'm glad I was in town. I'm glad my son was here. The rest of the family uh, couldn't be here. Um, I'm just really glad Teddy is here. You know, he obviously never got to meet my dad. And he is a lover of the water. And he is a lover of fast cars. And he's a kite surfer. So he, w he and my dad would have really loved each other. And so he's going to be able to kite around the buoy, which is very fun <laughs> to think about. Um, and I actually, I think a lot of you know, um, who know me, I love the stories about my dad. I really do. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I really do. You know, he was a full range of a person. Ron's wearing red. I'm wearing red in honor of dad. There was a lot, Yachtsman's luncheons we did years ago where I said, I got up and said something like, oh, he had a lot of shades of gray. And then Daru Kowalkowski got up and she goes, there was nothing gray about Tommy. So <laughs> I'm wearing my red sweater in his honor. Um, I had lunch recently with Paul Kayard, who I know is sailing in Miami, and he shared stories with me. So I just, I love the stories and um, it's really fun and we had a, celebration on the 20th anniversary of his passing at, in the Yacht Club and I was so bummed because we didn't film it and I was doing the AV in the back so I didn't really listen. So anyway, that that was a really great event so it's really fun to be here today to do this. Um, I never sailed with him. You guys were all really lucky, those of you who did, um, to sail with him. And um, I never, so I never really saw that side of him. Um, which was is hard for me because I now have a boat. I have a boat in Long Island. We have an Alarian 28, and I would love some tips from him. And um, so anyway, I don't tell a lot of people at that yacht club who my dad was because it would mean I'd have to be a better sailor than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he had a lot of facets to him, and you all have your personal stories of his. Fa he's super multifaceted, and I love I love all the stories. And you know the story as his kid. It was hard to be his daughter. And um, I, anyway, short, quick story. I went to a therapist when I was 22. I said, I want to have a relationship with my dad. Did all that. And when I was 24, I was working with him um, for his pro sale campaign. And how grateful am I that I, you know, resolved it all and was able to travel with him and kind of see that side of him that you guys all saw. Um, it was really fun. We were, went to Newport and North Carolina with Sid Morris. And so I got to see that side of him. Um, I also worked with him uh, on the 87 America's Cup and was able to get Stanford credit for whoever, you know, for my, my t stint at ESPN. And we all had a really good time down there. Um, when he, after he lost, you know, was eliminated, he did commentating. So that was really fun. Um, and, and again, I'm really psyched we can spruce this up uh, because it really needed it, I know. Anyone who wants to have me crew for them, I'm available, because it'd be fun to go around the buoy. And I'll just finish by saying, um, it's actually really fitting that it's a buoy, that it's out there in the bay, uh, because I've, you know, in my uh, phase of life I'm in, I'm really uh, working on ocean conservation. 
and protecting the ocean and the fact that he's out there in the bay so that's kind of my legacy I'm bringing forward for his time so the fact that he's out there he, his ashes are spread out there so he's everywhere in the bay and um, and I just think it's also fitting, you know, the carnage, the scene of carnage out there and lots of yelling and hysteria around the buoy. I'm sure there's been great stories and will continue to be great stories around the buoy. And he would love it. So I think it's perfect. It's like his like telep way to teleport down to earth to uh, keep things going. So with that, I look forward to everyone's stories and thank you again. Thanks Scott and Bruce and Ron and Pam and everybody for making this happen and continuing um, the tradition of having that the buoy out there, the racing buoy. So, thank you. so with this stroke, we christen this buoy Thomas Black Collar Buoy Weathermark. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so we, I, he loved to hear stories. So the mic is open. So the mic is open for Tommy's stories. Uh, everybody is welcome to come on up and share a story or two. He has so many good buddies here. There was nobody, nobody that Tommy trusted more than Kitty, his soldier Keith. First of all, thanks for everybody for doing this, Scott, and everybody. Um, pretty interesting with Tom and my sailing career with him. Uh, I'll tell you two quick stories that, you know, just kind of how Tom was and then the one that I think is the most important. Uh, in 77, I got to go to Australia with Tom and sail on the six meter. And we raced against Paul Elstrom and David Forbes. Pretty windy. I was 20 years old and um, it was big waves, windy, windy, and the boat was sinking for sure. And it was just like, you know, it, no, no life jacket, you know, are we really going to make this? And uh, first start, we roll over the top of Elfstrom in Forbes, which was pretty impressive in itself. And Black Holler goes around the leech of the mainsail, holds, has Maul hold the tiller, and he yells at Forbes, gold medal my ass. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there is in um, in 72 David Forbes won a gold medal in Kiel. And David Forbes had never beaten Tom Blackhaller in a Starboat race in his life. To get to the Olympics through the United States in the Starboat class you had to beat um, Dennis and uh, in that time Alan Holt. And so Tom just felt that it wasn't right that David Forbes should be having a gold medal. What's interesting is the career went on, David and Tom became the best of friends. And David had a boat here in a big boat series that maybe Scott sailed with them. And uh, Tom and David became incredibly close friends. And uh, they're staying in touch with each other their entire life. In 82, 83, we. Um, at least was back east. We were uh, trying to deal with the defender. And Tom, in that time, had certain things he wanted to happen with the program. And one of them is he didn't like the way Brooks and Gatehouse instruments worked. And he didn't like the way coming out of attack that Brooks and Gatehouse recorded speed. And he just said, it's all wrong. You know, either take that <laughs> off the boat or, um, <laughs> you know, you know, get me something that works. So we started with an instrument company called Occam, which at that time hadn't been in the America's Cup. It was pretty impressive and I'm putting the system in the boat and we're making things work and Tom says, you know, Ken, there are these guys from MIT that want to come and you need to work with them and get the rest of the instrumentation in the boat. So on once a week we'd have a technology meeting and the guy I'd been working with him, guys from MIT for about a week, putting in all the new sensors, and the guy gets up, and Tom had been instructing me what to do, right? You know, here's what you're doing, make sure you're taking care of these guys, and I'm pretty impressed, we're putting all this stuff in. And um, we're in the technology meeting, 
and the guy from MIT that had been working with shoulder to shoulder for a week said, well, we're going to be able to predict the wind shifts before they come. <laughs> this is pretty really cool. Tom says, that's so much bullshit. Get out of here. <laughs> so that guy was fired. That was the end of him. <laughs> You know, in 82, 82, it's kind of interesting. From the same friends, Jacob, there were four people. Tom, Paul, John Bertrand, and myself. And, uh, you know, Tom had got us all together and he said, how we're going to win the cup in 82, 83 is we're just going to sail better than Dennis. There's a good idea, right? Shit, we just go sailing. <laughs> so that didn't work out so good because the defender, she didn't go so fast. So, um... In 85, he gets Paul and I together. Guys, I got it. I didn't have it right last time, but I got it right this time. What's that, Claus? Well, we're going to have a faster boat. Said, well, there's a good idea. <laughs> you have the best, best crew and the best sails and the best gear. You win by a lot. Count three. But in all seriousness, where Tom was so spot on in 86, 87, was he was convinced there were going to be so many competitors that we would not win the cup just going down the standard route. And, you know, the odds of beating Dennis just building a standard 12 meter and evolving a wing keel wasn't going to get us there. And his passion for the double rudder boat was blinding at times where he couldn't see that we had some problem, but he was absolutely right that that was the direction to go. And with just a little more time, a little more effort, in fact, for Perth, Australia, not for New Brood Island, but for Perth, Australia, that concept was the right concept. And I think that with Tom, your grandfather was so incredibly on top of things. He had a feel for what to do. Maybe his methodology about getting there was a little rough around the edges sometimes, but his gut instinct around the race course and on a boat was unsurpassed in my view. I, I became a member of the Yacht Club when I was 13 for this Yacht Club, but early, um, earlier on in that process, R.C. Keefe kind of took me under his wing, and J.T. Um, did the same, and I would go out on the power boats and watching the six-meter events, and it was uh, Blackhawk, like some event, we were coming back out of um, Berkeley Circle, and he says, get your charm on the boat, we need him to drive the boat, so I got, he like, dragged me in early, 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 and then when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school, and he um, calls up during Christmas break. He was he was a great organizer, but he was a little bit late on some things, and maybe not everybody was going to show up. I think um, uh, Commodore Tompkins was going to go to Australia and do the um, Australian American Challenge. And uh, he called me up, and and my mom was like so excited that Tom Blackwell was calling. And I got on the phone, and, and uh, he said, uh, Tommy, I'd like you to come to Australia and sail the six meter. And I'm like, absolutely. When when do we go? He goes, we're leaving in a week. I'm like, perfect. Let's go. And I'm going to miss a couple of, couple of weeks of school, and okay, that's for me, not a, not a problem. <laughs> and uh, we're down there, and we're sailing, and it, it's it's um, uh, pit water, um, so the, um, well, whatever, whatever the opera was, but we're sailing out of pit water, it's really Royal, windy. Royal Prince Albert. Royal Prince Royal Albert. Prince Albert. And Craig Healy's there, and um, we're having a great time, and we're, we're blasting along through these big waves, really, really wet, and another six meter sinking situation and we're four of us are down in the village pumping we're two arm pumping and kenny was there too we're down there pumping 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 and he and black all has got his foot underneath the back stay hiking out and he is just laughing just having the best time and he was so giddy about this whole experience and then um he asked me to do the american Cup soon after and i left high school to go do that and it was really cool it was a great experience and then i had a great opportunity um, after the America's Cup, and he again was looking for a trimmer to go to England. So I went to England, sailed great news with him in the '89 America's uh, Admiral's Cup. And um, again, I, I always heard these stories of Blackhall in the middle of the night crossing tacks with these different company, different country boats and stuff, and yelling out profanities or you know whatever he was saying. And, and um, I actually got to see it live. <laughs> it was such a cool experience. And we ended up winning that race. We won the Fastnet, and it was such a cool experience to sail with Tom. And um, that, that rolled me into working with Tom and Lisa through the Pro 40 Catamaran stuff. And I was thinking about that. I was like, good grief, right? This 
is a dog and pony show, and he absolutely hated that stuff, but he was really good at it, right? He was really good at showing people his enjoyment for the sport and spreading it through all these different things. So we would do the dog and pony shows on the boats, on the, um, on the Pro 40 Catamaran all over the bay, blasting along and like turning people into sailors, into saying, I really want to do this, this is really cool. And he had the forethought of the America's Cup coming to San Francisco in catamarans, right? And he was way ahead of his time. And he knew this stuff, and like Ken said, he was a, he had the foresight to see this stuff in the future, and um, he's just an amazing person. And I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I absolutely adored um, Tom. I had the opportunity, after Tom passing away, um, my future had changed, and I ended up staying with Dennis um, in the next America Scout. And um, what was amazing in that experience that I learned through um, mutual friends is that when Tom passed away, Dennis kind of lost the will, right? But the really competitive will, because his top competitor, his nemesis, who actually hated love, was gone. So you kind of saw a little bit of a shell of Dennis in the next America's Cup, and then he kind of got off the boat after that. But it was it was really interesting to see how he touched other competitors and how they got motivated to do it and how competitive they were because of Tom. So. I miss him every day. He's an amazing person, and uh, this is going to be great because hopefully I get to go around this mark many, many more times and see him uh, in our futures. You know. So it's really cool. Thank you. So I knew Tom pretty well. We sailed together quite a few times, particularly in San Diego with Kenny Beef and others here. Um, but uh, I, I want to tell one story about Tom. Ron mentioned uh, he was a contemporary of and competitor of Ted Turner. And uh, you know that uh, we all know Tom had a definite mouth. Sailing with Tom was a lot of fun. He was always telling stories, he was always entertaining, and it was just fun. And the uh, story I want to tell is the time that Tom was at the bar and Ted Turner was in the regatta uh, at the same time. And Tom and Ted definitely had a thing. Tom had a mouth, Ted was the mouth of the South. So we had two mouths going at the bar at the same time. And uh, they were going to race the next day. And Tom was talking, as he frequently did, in a voice loud enough for Ted to hear him and said, you know, we're going to beat Turner, we're going to beat Turner, da da da, and then started saying, I think we should bet on this race, making sure that Ted could hear him. And then finally he turned over toward direct Ted and said, so what do you think, Ted? Shall we bet on this next race? Ted says, okay, Tom, we can bet. And then Tom says, okay, Ted, how much you want to bet? And Ted says to Tom, how much money you got, Tom? I'm Sean Spencer, and um, I just want to start my story by saying, um, you always remember your first. I know where your racing minds are going. No, um, in this case, it was my first job. Uh, I was living in Alameda, and I was nowhere near, of, uh, near as accomplished a sailor as Tommy or Russ. I was just sort of getting into the sport, crewing for my dad, and so I went down to the North Sales Loft, which was in Alameda. Um, Tom and Steve Taft were running the North Sales Loft, and I went in there and I said to Tom, I said, hey, uh, can I have a summer job working here? And he goes, oh yeah, sure, come, yeah, we'll hire you. So I come down there and I thought, oh, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna learn all about sail design. I'm gonna be with these rock star sailors. I'm gonna get the trajectory, you know, all that stuff. Well, my job was out in a railroad, a railroad car out in the parking lot, <laughs> and I was, my job was to cut spinnaker panels all day long in an unventilated railroad car. <laughs> and the fumes were going everywhere. And, it was, and I would just cut these panels and then I'd take them into the loft and they'd sew them up and I'd go back out and cut some more panels. <laughs> so this went on for quite a while. And, uh, and then, uh, then they said, uh, 
they said to me, and I, by the way, this was the mid 70s, and I think I might have just had my driver's license. And every day I would bring my sailing gear with me, and I kept it in my car thinking, one of these days I'm going to go sailing with these guys. <laughs> so this went on for quite a while, and then uh, one day I was delivering them some panels into the loft, and, and uh, Tom says, Hey, Sean, you want to go look at a kite with us? And I'm like, Oh my God, yes, I'm, count me in. So I go bolting out of the office. I run out to my car. I thought they, they must have thought I was crazy or something. I grab my backpack. I come running back into the office. They grab the bag. They hand it to me. Go here, you carry it. I'm like, okay, fine, no problem. So I'm thinking we're gonna go down to a boat and go out sailing, you know, on the estuary and look at this kite. And they start walking this other way toward back out to the park. I'm like, oh, we're gonna drive somewhere. Maybe we're going to the city. You know, I had no idea, but I wasn't gonna say a word, right? Well, we go to this stairwell. And it goes up the side of the building, up onto the roof. And they lead me up there, and there's a yard arm up there. And they hook the kite up, and they poof, pull it up, and they look at it, and they study it for a minute. Ian Bone, they're looking at, oh, the shoulder's this, or, you know, a couple of things there. Yeah, it looks okay, though. They pull it down. They go, Sean, put it back in the bag. Okay. <laughs> put it back in the bag. Yeah. And, um, and that was it. That was my whole uh, experience of learning from, the, from uh, Tom and Steve that summer in terms of like, real life experience. But actually, no, they were very welcoming, and they, uh, a little bit later, they must have felt bad for me because they gave me a job inside the loft doing handwork. And uh, so I got to put grommets in and all that stuff and stencil sale numbers on. But I'll never forget your father, the way he would sit. I, I can still visualize that office exactly the way it was. He would sit with his feet up on the desk. He was always kind of leaning back and he had the phone against his shoulder like this and he was talking all the time, you know, hands moving, big stories as I would walk in and out of that office. So I remember him very well. And uh, he was a great man. <laughs> the first time I met him, you probably don't know this, it was in 1974 at the membership meeting when I was inducted in as a member of St. Francis Yacht So was Tom, except he was a transfer. If you got to remember, in those days, there were some really good sailors in that class. Russell Lester, one of them, Chris Perkins, Chuck Madrigali, Tad Lacey and company like that. He says, I got to learn from Tom, he might come up. So I was probably one of his first customers. It's Tom calling <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, don't bad mouth me, he says. <laughs> so sure enough, he shows up. This was a winter race, you know, but it's not too busy. Uh, run by San Francisco Yacht Club. There's like a dozen rows 19s. Russell Lester being one of those guys, and the race committee did the, the usual job they do over there. You couldn't start on starboard. You, you, you could not cross the line on starboard. So everybody's lined up on the port. That's about 11 of us, except for one. That's Russ. So, <laughs> you remember that one? I do. I do. <laughs> I remember. You were probably about 11 or 12 years old, right? Yeah, 12 or 13, yeah. <laughs> and so, my crew and I, we were crewing for Tom, he's steering, we figure we don't have to tell him that, there's a boat on starboard, right? He's asleep, I have no idea what he was doing the night before. Of course, we followed Russ, and Russ, you know, went on, and Tom didn't say anything, and I'm kind of embarrassed, I don't know what the hell, maybe we should have said something. So, in those days, you got disqualified if you followed somebody, right? So, you just let him go, and Tom is following. So, we're following up to, uh, Yellow Bluff, and we're last, obviously. And he's like to sleep. I said, this is gonna be a wasted day, you know, I'm not learning anything. Then we get around the <coughs> Yellow Bluff, going downwind, and like he woke up. Both starts planing, and I learned something about him. So fast is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the lesson I learned. This is okay, you really want to sail on the ebb tide on San Francisco Bay because the Lord legs are really long and they're a lot of fun. So thanks, Tom. I learned fast as fun. <laughs> Tony, I do remember that very, very well, actually. I remember uh, beating Tom Blackhall in that race. I was like, wow, I'm like 13 years old and I beat Tom Blackhall in the race with Chris Jack. So uh, I was thinking there's three things that I, I can take away from Tom. 
first one was, I think it was probably in high school, and we were over at Richmond Yacht no one else was there. He was working on a star boat, I was working on my laser. I was like a senior in high school. And he kind of starts picking on me, like, you know, you don't know Jack, and, and I'm like, really, you know? And I'm now probably like 170, 180, and he's kind of getting in my face a little bit, you know, and I'm like 17 years old. I, he's kind of like, you know, I, when I was, I went to Ber uh, Berkeley High, there was all the white guys in the front, and the black guys in the back, and we were an awesome football team, and I was an offensive lineman, you know, like, okay, and I'm like, yeah, well, I'm playing football too, okay, so let's go. And so we go. So here he is, he lines up, gets up in the stands, comes at me, and I actually pick him up, put him down, and I was like, that was the first time I felt like a real man, because I, like, <laughs> I have taken on someone a little older than me. So that was, Tom made me feel like a man for the first time. <laughs> and then uh, the second time was, uh, I think it was like 1986, we were in the SRC, and I had not done much big boat sailing, we were on Blade Runner, and I'd been driving most of the time during the daylight, and then it got kind of shifty and funky, and at the night, he just basically came up to me, hip checked me out of the way, and says, I'm driving, and I'm like, okay, it's all yours. So that was the second time. That was kind of taught me humility. And then the last thing, um, Tommy, I think you were on the boat when we raced Eagle in the November 87 uh, America's Cup in Perth. Um, it was the second round and Eagle was slow. And there was a line that I still kind of remember. It was that confidence that uh, the only way we're going to lose, basically. The only way we're going to lose this race is if one of you dumb falls off the boat. <laughs> we're all like, okay, you know, everyone's gotten lower now, and needless to say, no one fell off the boat, but we did lose the race. So that was the last thing I wanted to like. And the number three went overboard. Remember that? And you went back and got the number three in the gym. Okay, well, it was the same. But anyway, we lost the race to Eagle, we shouldn't have lost. And, and uh, that, that always, you know, whenever you think you're going to win, you should win, don't put it in the bank. So um, I love Tom for that. And the last thing I'd say with Tom, I mean, whenever I asked him for something or asked him for help, he was always there from the time of making a movie or whatever, um, calling a sponsor or helping me raise money way back when. Um, it was a genuine love and I think um, an admiration to make the club and the sailors better who represented this club. So for that, I'm forever grateful. And Lisa, my best to you. <laughs> my name, is, for the, those of you who don't know me, is Tad Lacey. I like so many people gathered here today in memory and honor of Tom, grew up sailing with him. So Tom had a special spot, particularly in the old boatyard there. He'd take us young kids under his wings and he'd show us how to do things better. And he made all of us um, much, much better sailors. But there was a price to be paid. Russ alluded to it earlier as some <laughs> others have. If you were ever sailing with Tom on a boat and you made a mistake. You got a ration of hell and rash, uh, uh, rash talk from Tom for about 30 minutes. So the reason that most of us went on to become relatively good sailors is we wanted to sail well enough so we didn't make a mistake and have Tom yell at us. And that's how he taught us all to be great sailors. We're internally grateful. Lisa, nice to see you. So Tom, thank you very much. I know you're smiling down because we can see this mark a hell of a lot better from the middle of the bay. <laughs> okay, so 83 Cup wasn't all that good for Tommy. Uh, as Kitty said, uh, Defender, you know, wasn't all that fast. Pedro did a good job designing it, but it wasn't a fast boat, as Tommy used to say. And they cut the boat in half, you know, Thorn ships and then four and a half. Boat still couldn't get fast. So for 87, he says, look, 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 we can't follow, as Kenny said, the same path. We've got to do something different. So we came up with this whole R1 idea. We actually held meetings in Tom's place over in the Watergate's apartment, and we had Mull and Calderon and Heiner Melder there, the computational physicists, and we finally came up with this idea. We looked at several really nutty ideas, but the idea of a bow rudder and a bulb keel. So anyway, we, we get a bunch of um, other ideas, but they're not as good as this one idea. And I want to point out that that bulb keel is now, that is to say, a version of it on all the serious racing monohulls on the planet ever since. All those bulb keels came from USA. Anyway, when we get the thing, uh, the idea pretty much sketched out, uh, we decided we got to build a prototype. So we built a prototype. And we built this soling prototype. And then Tom says, oh my god, 
you know, we gotta go sail this thing in the dark so nobody knows what it looks like. So Kenny and the boys trail the boat up to Antioch, right by the big Antioch Bridge. Blackheart and I drive up in my car, and I, I'm going around this one turn, and I'm going like 130, and because we gotta get our up there, because, you know, we're never on time. As I'm going around the turn at 130 to get onto Highway 5, Blackheart is screaming at me, Faster, faster, don't step on the brakes, step on the gun again! The Germans lost the war, trying to engineer shit better, and you waste their talent on this car, step on it, young, step on it! Anyway, so we're flying down here, I get up to like 140 or some crazy illegal speed. We arrive in the dark, and uh, so there's Kenny and Hank the Jig Stewart and other guys, and they got the boat already. And the plan is for Ducharme and Young and Blackheart to go sail this first ever experimental thing with the two rudders. So Ducharme and I go out there with Tommy. We're sailing around in this nondescript place because the sun finally comes up, and it's, oh, nobody saw the boat go in on the lift because it was black, dark at night. We're sailing, got the darn boat around in this utterly dull place, and Blackheart is doing this with the, so the two rudders. We had two rudders, you know, because we were just coming up with the idea of having cyclical steering or collective steering with the bow and the stern rudder. How should we tack it like this? Should we tack it like this? And we go, we think we're going fast, but there's nobody to race against, so we have no idea. We come back to the dock, and he turns to me and says, Jesus Christ. Is this the best we can ever do? <laughs> we have no proof. This is a cockamamie idea. And even if it's fast, I don't think we'll ever learn how to steer the goddamn thing. <laughs> That's literally, that turned out to be prophetic. Because in fact, it was a brilliant idea. And had we, he and I discussed this a lot. Had we had probably, we actually discussed this very, maybe five more weeks of figuring out. Kenny did this masterful job of how do you how do you turn a rudder at the other end of the boat? We had tubes, and this is before we had, you know, this before they had cabling and stuff like that. And he went through iteration and iteration of the steering, but Tom was right. We actually were on the right path. But we started later than everybody else that we couldn't actually get to, to the tree circle. So uh, one more. So we're in Perth, and uh, it's like the December trials. You might have been in the audience, they said we do this press conference right afterwards. And uh, Tom is up there with the New Zealand guys and Dennis. And Dennis looks over to New Zealand guys and he says, I don't know why you wouldn't build a plastic boat unless you wanted to cheat. And he says this in this press conference that's being broadcasted in you know, uh, Australia 7. And Blackwater turns around and goes, <laughs> I don't think you should have said that, Dennis. I don't think you should have said that. And that clip got to be like the biggest clip in the America's Cup because it was Tommy being super colorful and actually calling a spade a spade, which is what he did so well. So we want more black hole stories. Hearing these stories about Tom barking at people, and I saw a lot of that and I had a lot of pictures. I was taking pictures of Ken on the boat you know, before we took off in Australia. And I was so proud of him and Tom was always like this. And Ken, oh my God, you know, and I felt so bad for Ken, but they have this great working relationship. But I, I was a little intimidated by your dad, right? And Ken was gone all the time, working, you know, 20 hours a day, as they all did. And I was getting a little frustrated. Yeah. And um, one night, I definitely had been drinking some wine, and uh, Ken came home, and I don't exactly remember what tipped me off, but I said, I am so sick of you not being here. I can't believe it. I took the door and I'm slamming it into the cinder block wall, walking out the door. I, I can't believe it. Your father walks up the stairs. And, <clears throat> well, it was not a very nice lady's mouth. I said, God damn it, in your boat. <laughs> I am so sick of you. And I ran down the stairs with the keys in my hand and went driving for a while and pulled off. So, Every time I saw your dad after that, he was so kind to me. Not a stay out of your way. I only um, sailed with Tom once. And I don't remember it was like a, a big boat series and we were on a 40 foot boat with a lot of people. And I was running the bow for him. And he was the only skipper. Because when it's time to jive and they want to jive, they just start, you know, push the tiller or whatever. And, and Tom would always, when we did the, the whole series, he would always look up all the way to the bow and he would nod. And when he nodded, like trip or whatever, I'd yell trip. And it was, we, you know, we won the series and all that stuff. And at the end of that, 
He said, Skip, you're the greatest. If I ever get an American's Cup vote, you're my bow man. Yeah. And a dialogue. And you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, he, you know, he got the American's Cup vote. And I saw him at the bar and I said, hi, Tom. And he goes, hi, Skip. And I said, do you remember what you told me? And he said, yep, I do. And I said, I said well, Tom, I'm getting pretty old now. I'm going to just have to bow out of this one. He says, thank you, Skip. <laughs> Well, I think this was about 1980, I'm sure, and um, Tom Blackholler was skippering Bruce's boat, leading lady, and afterwards, and they won, it was great. Afterwards, we were at a party, and Doug was there, and Tom, and I was talking to both of them, and I said, Tom, you get a little tummy, and he said, yeah, and the girls love it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I got one. Perfect. Perfect. 1969 Transpac. Close, close. close. Wow. Lift up the mic. 1969 Transpac. We all finished the race. We're all in the Ilikai. Tom had too much to drink. We tied him up in a sail bag and put him in the elevator going up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so K.R. is driving his boat across the country to take it to, I think, Ontario. And uh, Paul has told this story to me many times. And so uh, he, just before he leaves, he says, just drive the boat across, that's all I gotta do to Tom? And Tom says, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. By the way, new deck, put the jib leads in. All the way across the country. K.R. is thinking, where do I put the jib leads? No instructions, there's no cell phones, he can't call him. He gets there, calls Tom, can't reach him. Tom's out with some girl doing things and he doesn't know how to reach him, so he doesn't have no idea where to put the jib leads. Carrot goes everywhere, measures all the competitive boats, Buddy's boat, Dennis's boat, measures them all, decides right where to put the jib leads, puts the jib leads uh, where he thinks they're best, still can't reach Tom. Tom blows off the first race, doesn't even arrive in time for the first race, goes out the second day for the uh, second race, and they're going up the weather uh, lake, port tack, and Buddy is next to him, and they're in front of DC, and he says, to um, Tommy says, Carrot says, hey, so looks back and says, how do you like where the jib leads are? Black says, huh, what? He says, how do you like where the jib leads are? Huh, what? How do you like where I put the jib leads? Black Arrow looks at him according to Garrett and says, what the F, shut up. If that was important, I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> more Tommy stories. I'll tell you a few more. Perfect, Lisa, perfect. Okay. okay. So, so as you know, um, Dad was a gambler, and I would love to hear just also from you guys stories about he was into the barter system, right? He yes, really, yes. I think a lot of money flowed through him. He never made a lot of money, or if he did, it went in and, and then it went out, <laughs> which is so, I think, actually kind of cool. You know, he would have, call, people would call up and say, can you make a suit of sales for me? Uh, and then he'd get to go to Italy and race their, their boat in Italy. And someone else would ask him to make sales and he'd say, okay, then can you buy tires for my race car? <laughs> so it, he really was in the barter system. And so for me, when I went to work for him on the uh, pro sale, I had graduated from college and he was mad at me for some reason. And so it was actually right down here one day during the Big Boat Series, I went to visit him because this was his office to me. You know, he was a professional sailor before anybody made any money at it. So this, to me, was where I went to see him at his office. And so we went down, I went down on the dock, and he said, hey, Lisa, you know, I'm so sorry. I know I was kind of mad at you when you graduated from college. Would you like to come work for me? So barter system, you know, he was getting something out of the deal by helping me, which was just, which I loved about him. And I know, I'd love to hear stories like that from people, because it really was just fascinating. You know, he really wasn't about acquiring things or money. Uh, he was really about living life and experiencing things. And there's one story someone told, and I'd love to hear people corroborate the story, that he was in the Transpac, and he was sailing, and he wanted to, it was light air, and he wanted to get rid of one of the jibs. And whoever the owner of the boat was on the boat said, you know, I'm not gonna do that. And he said, all right, I'm gonna write a check for $5,000, and he pulled out his checkbook, 
wrote a check to the owner for $5,000 and they threw the jib overboard <laughs> to uh, lighten the load from the race. <laughs> so, um, and then also really interestingly, when I was working for ESPN, you know, ESPN was a fledgling network. They were only eight years old at that point. And they, when we were working for ESPN, David Letterman had texted or sent like a telegram saying, oh, good job on covering the America's Cup or sailing. I thought ESPN was only a, mud, a network for mud wrestling. So it was really the early days of ESPN. And the really early days of the technology where there were onboard cameras. And ESPN you know, was kind of making it up as they went along. And they went, I think they first went to Dennis and said, you know, can we put, can we test out these little cameras on your boat? And Dennis wanted nothing to do with it. So he put, they put, ESPN came and put the first little lipstick camera on, on USA because dad was willing, you know, he was forward thinking and willing to make that happen. So that he really started, helped start the technology of how we cover sailing in television, which I think is really cool. And I love the stories about that engineering mind for him. And so I really, it's been fun today hearing you, your guys' stories. And as they say, I'm always up for the stories and um, it's great to be here. So thanks. Uh, so I was lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time with Tom on six meters, 12 meters, IOR boats, traveled the world with him, saw him at his best and uh, <laughs> you know, all the other times. <laughs> he, was um, he loved small rodents, guys who sailed with him. What was his favorite mouse? Oh, come on. It was a shithouse mouse. <laughs> that was one of his favorite things he'd yell in the, when things went poorly. And um, after sailing with Tom, I was in therapy too. <laughs> Both Russ and I were trimmers on US 61 and 49, which meant Tom was right here. He was in he was in your ear, so and he knew as much about your job as you did, so when you didn't do it right, you were gonna hear about it immediately. And he did uh, I forget whether it was Kenny or somebody said that he made us better sailors because of, of his expectations of us. But Tom at his his uh, at his self, we were playing golf in cows in in, um, in England. It was a day off of the Admiral's Cup. And Tom on the golf course where most people, especially the British, tend to be rather reserved and quiet when they're playing, Tom was being the, the, uh, the ugly American and was just making so much noise and laughing so hard that there was a group of British people on another green, which is pretty close to the green we were on, and Tom was laughing and having a great time. And these guys were just could not disguise their disgust at what was going on. And they were crossing their arms. And Tom, he said this. He turned to them. He goes, why don't you guys shut the hell up? If it wasn't for us, you'd all be speaking German. They were the diplomat. Oh. So, um, yeah. That was, that was Tom at his uh, best or worst. I don't know. How but it was, uh, it was a great... A time in my life to sail with him and uh, he really did change my life because of all the opportunities that he gave me and uh, I'm so glad I could just be a small part of of this and um, and I will be in charge of maintaining it and it will always look nice and it's a, a very small thing that I can do in appreciation for what he's done for me thank you A boat called Santana, and we we're going to do a match race with a, with a boat called Duraid. And so, uh, RC Keep was running the Duraid program, and they got, I can't remember who they got, they got a hotshot skipper, and so I called Tommy and I said, you know, why don't you join us on this? So he did. And uh, I brought along the sailing uh, editor from uh, Sports Illustrated, and she's on Sarah Pelosi, and she's on the back of the boat just locked in on Tommy, and she just couldn't get over him. And, and the, the article that came out in Sports Television, it's like a cowboy on a bucking bronco, laughing, hooting, <laughs> swearing. <laughs> and we won the race, we, uh, we really won the race, but big time, but Tommy's just unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I think I saw your boat leaving the harbor in San Francisco, and I know the reason was you want to go around that thing before anyone else. <laughs> you got it absolutely great. I, I want to know one thing, Ron. If I hit it, is it going to damage my boat? <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> Don't hit this buoy. Teddy, you've been around that buoy in all kinds of forms before. You plan to go around first, second, always, <laughs> always and only. First. <laughs> Tommy wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> Perfect. That's nice good. looking buoy. Isn't that good? Let's go here. It's a beautiful buoy, and uh, you know it's it's twice, maybe three times, maybe four times the size of the one that's out there now, right? And uh, nowhere near the size of uh, Tom Blackaller's personality, that's for sure. And uh, Ron, that thing's big enough. I think you're going to be able to see it and hopefully not hit it. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good on you, Pete. That's great. <laughs> As a famous female sailor. You've been around that buoy a few times before when you when it was barely visible, hardly above the waterline. How do you feel about the new buoy? You're going to go around it first or what? Well, I intend to try and go around that buoy first in every race that I have to round it. But um, I have to say that um, today was really special. Um, I I didn't uh, I never met Tom. He, for me, he was sort of he's one of those sailors in the pantheon of sailor gods. And hearing everybody speak, and uh, particularly the people who had a chance to sail with him, and um, to hear their stories and and the influence that he was to them, it um, it was really moving, and it it makes me understand that you know he really was sort of like their Peter Pan. Clearly, you know he was one of the boys, and he uh, he was uh, very special. But he's also one of that he's like a mythological character that um, you know makes this girl want to go play with the boys out on the water. And uh, every time I get a chance to sail against these guys and sail with them, which is extra lucky, um, I definitely feel fortunate and um, in some way um, you know lucky to get a little bit of Tom Blacko brush brush off on me. So thanks. Thanks, Nicole Bro. Very humble for such a brilliantly good sailor, such a decorated sailor, holy cow. So Zach Berkowitz, you've won about, you know, more than a dozen national championships. Talk to us about the legacy of Black Color. How's it gonna feel going around that building? Two questions. Uh, I can't wait to sail around Black Color. I mean, Tom was very influential when I was young. And I'll never forget that uh, I was over at the loft and I had no money and I was sailing 470s and there was a brand new Omen bag and I'm like what's up there and he goes I don't know go take a look so I went and looked and I go it's a uh, 470 bag and I go whose is it he goes it says almond sales on it I don't know I don't care he goes if you want it you can have it take it so I took it and then I called Omen and I asked because I was racing against the guy and he said just keep it you know, and I understand but Tom Tom was very uh much to just get in it get it done and enjoy it and have fun out there so this is another way of having fun with Tom back on the course. So, you know, the thing is, a few people did actually race in more races than Tom, not many. And a few people won a lot of races like Tom. But I don't know anybody who actually had more fun racing sailboats than Tom Black. You know, he seemed to have fun on the water and off the water. Tom was just a fun guy. And, you know, we need more people like Tom Black on it. John Rubisa, you have raced in more than a thousand races in San Francisco Bay. What, how's it feel? How's it going to feel going around that pool? Oh, I have to think about that. that, that uh, very exciting. I don't want to hit it. It's too big, too heavy. I like the soft one. <laughs> but it'll be exciting. Talk to me a little experience you had with Tom. I sailed on a six meter with him in 79. And so that was uh, pretty exciting. We sailed, we, had, we spent the summer at Shilshul in Washington, racing the nationals and then the worlds in six meters. And um, it was, uh, we, we won the nationals, we won the worlds. 
then we came down for the Oz Am Cup here. So it was pretty exciting. But all the stories about six meters sinking is all true, except Shilshul never blew hard enough. It was always light enough. So it was pretty fun. Was the water coming in the cockpit or through the bottom of the boat? No, over the top. <laughs> <laughs> over one, under one, over one, under one? Oh, yes, right, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Tony, so how many races do you think you've managed at St. Francis Yacht Club? I can't quite remember, but I did 20 uh, big boat series. And I uh, started doing races in 1975. So that's a few races. Well, I, yeah, I do a number of races a year. Exactly. So uh, how do you feel about this new buoy that we just are dedicating today? Well, I feel like we can finally use the buoy. I've been trying to avoid it for the last few years. <laughs> You've been skipping that mark if you could because nobody could find it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We try to set a mark somewhere near the vicinity that you could see so we couldn't use the yellow glove. Oh, excuse me, we couldn't use the black hole. Uh, the last race we did around that one was the Jessica Cup with the big boats, and they really, I mean, these are classics, right? Uh, schooners and catches and things like that. And they really did have trouble finding it, even though those, these guys have been sailing on the bay for 50 years. Exactly. I've raced it around hundreds of times, and in the last couple of years, you couldn't find the mark. You know, I'd say, where's the weather mark? And people would say, it's up there somewhere. <laughs> Keep going to weather, we'll find it. <laughs> Well, sometimes, sometimes with the current, you know, it actually is not in the place we expect. You know, because the difference between flood and the ebb, you know, it would find itself in different places. You kind of think you know where it is with respect to the shore. You look at that building on the shore, so oh, yeah, it's over there. No, 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 it's over there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Ted, you're the grandson of the great Tom Black collar. Holy moly! Those are some pretty big shoes to be looking at. Their footprints, you know. Talk to us about what it feels like to be the grandson. Um, well, yeah, as you said, it's some pretty big shoes to fill. Um, although I never met my grandfather, I got to hear a lot about him through my mom and through his friends. And it's really great to have the character that he was described as come to life in these stories. But I think a lot of him, um, I feel the passion that he had for the water, and I think that was passed down a lot to me through my mother, through him, um, my love for surfing and kite surfing, and just kind of the drive to get out there and live life to its fullest. How's it going to feel to kite surf around that buoy? Uh, I think it's going to be uh, pretty fantastic. It's pretty incredible because I've been kiting a lot out at Chrissy Field, and it's good to know that kind of just my, my grandfather's watching over me while I'm out there. To the limit one more time. 13 on the rake meter. Okay, you guys got we squared away on this pack? You ever heard that defender dog go 8 3 upwind? You ever hear it 8 3? Not once. Not once. <laughs> you know, Alan Bond came up to us on the stage while we were announcing the America's Cup and he said, the America's Cup ought to be in the fastest boats and the most high-tech boats that they are. They ought to be 85-foot maxis. And I said, Alan, the fastest boats are catamarans. What about catamarans? Says, catamarans? No, no. Two of those big cats racing against each other, just with the with the pedal to the metal and flying hulls and putting big sails up, could be extremely exciting in 15 knots a minute. I'd be back in the America's Cup in a minute if it was held in big, fast boats in San Francisco Bay. I guess that means I won't be back in it. <laughs> Thank you for watching Remembering Black Color and Most Colorful Sailing Legend Part 1. We'll be back with Part 2 of Remembering Black Color in March.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.